Okay, so as a Gen Xer with a bad back who's very jealous of Steve meeting Yasmin Bleeth, I'm here to extol the, uh, the virtues of sit-stand desks. They're amazing. <laughs> um, so we're talking about bringing the non-traditional to the traditional because when we were looking at the future of work, it's funny how three different people have come up with almost identical talks on what the future of work's going to look like. Um, our company looks at engagement and participation. That's what we do. That's our bread and butter. We're trying to increase engagement. And by engagement, it's getting people to do more things and be happier about doing it. It's that idea of wanting to be there, wanting to do work, just as Steve was saying. They, we, we want people to enjoy what they're doing. We've all heard the legends of engagement, the Googles, the Netflixes, the Expedias, the ones who give everybody infinite amount of holiday, the ones who give uh, slides and pull tables and ball pits. I still want the ball pit in our office. Um, but we've all heard these things, and we all look at it and go, that sounds really interesting, but can it work for us? And the answer probably is not always, because every, every different company has different ways of working, different cultures. Um, and the people who respond to the things that Google do around engagement, and that Netflix do, and that Expedia do, are the sorts of people that they're recruiting, and the sorts of people that are attracted to them. So they're engaged by these things. So it won't necessarily work for everyone. And it's almost a short-sighted view, because engagement, and the future of engagement especially, the future of work, doesn't start when they walk through the door on the first day, it starts at the point where they think, I like the look of this place. And then moves into, I know I like it and I know I want to work here. All the way through to the last day when they leave, they go, that was brilliant. I really loved every minute of that. I'm going to tell everyone about it. And at some point, you never know, I might even come back. That's what we want people to be. That's what engaged employees really look like. They want to be there. And when they go, they're happy to come back. And they don't go because they're miserable, they go because there are better opportunities, and the company has supported them to go, and it explains to them that it's okay to go, because everyone feels scared of leaving a company. So that whole journey is what employee engagement really looks like. It's not just that one-off sort of injection of motivation, that one-off little sort of happy, happy moment. The way we were looking at it when we were coming up with this talk, and it was a team effort, not going to take credit for that, um, was that successful companies have got to engage their talent at a deeper level, creating active participants rather than passive employees. Now, a passive employee is what I would say is a standard vision that you have of an employee who gets in at 9 o'clock, does their job, and at 5, 5.30, clock off, go home, not their problem after that. And that's fine. Companies are built on that. There are lots of companies out there who thrive based on that. But actually, as we move forwards through the new sort of generations of people coming into work, that isn't really what happens anymore. That's not how people think now um, in the sort of the newer generations. And sadly, I don't count myself in that anymore. I am not a millennial. I just missed it by two years, and I'm very upset about that. Um, but I do like video games, so you know, that's fine. So what we're actually looking for with engaged employees now are people who have a voice, who want to get involved, who want to improve and get sort of recognised in the company. They want to improve the company. They want to help the company be as good as it can be. You still need the nine-to-fivers. There still is that level of work that needs doing. Not everyone has to be that go-getter who's going to change the way the company works, but one of the things we feel very passionate about is that everybody needs that opportunity if they want it. And it's about how you engage them. How do you engage the mother of the two who works three days a week and really just needs to support the children? My wife does exactly that because nursery was more expensive than working. Working actually, um, you know, doing smaller hours and spending time with the kids was better for her because it meant she got to see the children. How do you engage somebody who's only there for a few hours a day and whose real objective is to support their family? Now, at Motivate, we kind of look at things across a lot of different areas. Uh, one of the words that I'm here to talk about a little bit is gamification. That's my thing. But there's a lot to it. And understanding how to engage people involves a lot of thought and research and a lot of talking to people. Um, and a lot of the work that we do, the front end, is very, very heavily research-laden because 
if you just sort of sit there and go, we think this is how your company should be, we're likely to get it wrong. But if we talk to the people who are at the bottom of the traditional org chart and speak to them and understand why they feel they need to be engaged and aren't currently motivated and engaged, you get much more value from that. And over the time we've been doing this, we've kind of come up with three key areas that are really important and that we feel we affect quite, quite effectively. Because they're the things that we've wanted to do and things that we've missed in our employment over the years, things we've seen other people are missing, and their consistency, advocacy, and technology. And the reason these are so important as we move forward is because the way that we work has changed entirely. That nine to five doesn't happen as much as it used to. It's beginning to drop as a trend because everyone's got a mobile phone. So when was the last time anyone in here answered an email after 5.30 on their phone? A show of hands. Yeah. So would you consider yourself a nine to five worker? No, because after five o'clock, you're still working. You don't mind doing it usually because it's just something that's convenient and it means it's one less thing to do the next morning. But the number of times on Sunday evenings I'm sat on my phone just trawling through emails just to make sure that Monday morning's a bit less of an impact pretty much every week because it's just how I like to work. And without decentralization of hours and decentralization of location, work from home, bring your own device, consistency becomes really important because if you look at a global organization, every country has a different way of doing things. But not just every country, every region, every office have their own unique ways of doing things. As you leave the office, those unique things become an individual thing. So somebody who may start their working day at 10 o'clock in the morning rather than 9 because it's more convenient because they'll then work to 7 or 8. You need a consistency around that somehow. Advocacy. Social media has been the making and breaking of so many companies in the last 10 years. One tweet from a disgruntled employee that says a truth that a company didn't want can destroy it. You look at somebody um, in Elon Musk's position where one tweet and suddenly Tesla's share drops through the floor because he said something that the shareholders didn't like very much. So with, with that kind of decentralization, with that individuality in companies, voice becomes very important, which also goes back to consistency. And technology. Every company wants to be innovative. And the chart that uh, Steve was showing earlier, radical to dinosaur. And it's where do you sit in that? How do, how do you use technology? And a lot of people want that radical, but really aren't in a position to do radical because they don't understand it themselves. So how are their employees going to understand it? But it looks cool and we want it. So these are the three things that we thought really are important moving forwards now, and things we have to understand and be able to manage. So I wanted to talk you through a small case study, something that we've built recent, well, been going for now six months. Um, and it's something that kind of covers some of that in a way that was a bit more interesting. And it's called Zebra Island. Now, the idea of Zebra Island was to create something that would help with global onboarding. Who here has been sat in an onboarding session at a large company where for two days you watched PowerPoint presentations? Show of hands. Quite normal. It is the normal, sadly. Um, my personal experience of that is one day of PowerPoints, then being taken out uh, for a nice meal this, uh, that evening, getting really quite merry, and coming in the next day hung over and having to watch the marketing presentation. I then, two years later, was the person doing the marketing presentation and watching the poor, poor, poor people in the audience who could barely open their eyes have to listen to me speak for half an hour about why the internet was so important to their lives. It's, it's not something that works for everyone. Face-to-face -face is important, but it wasn't, it wasn't so important that some of it can't get taken away. So with Zebra Island, we put all of that into something that felt a bit like a game. We used gamification. And the idea was that all of this material that they would normally get in a two-day PowerPoint presentation was part of an adventure. They go in on day one, uh, they start to explore, and they go to different stations around the island, and each station unlocks different parts of the onboarding experience, different information. There are puzzles in there for them to solve based on that content. There are games to play just because games are fun. Um, and it's all done in a way that gives them a bit more time to do it. They have 30 days to do it. Most complete it in two days. 
because they actually quite enjoy the experience. But the point with it was that we weren't changing their materials, we were giving them a way of delivering it in a way that was interesting. Now the reason this is important is that it gave every single office in, the, in their global um, structure the same onboarding materials. There's no regionalization on it. So consistency and brand standardization. So that they all had the same voice when they speak about Zebra. Because what we found out really interestingly was that people would come into the company and say, this is a lot cooler than I thought it was. Just as, without this, just the company itself. They hadn't realized how good the company was to work for. So the brand perception was slightly wrong. So how do you change brand perception? You get people to talk about it differently. So giving everybody the same understanding by creating a consistent experience for every one of their seven odd thousand employees means that they can speak about it consistently and be a great advocate for the company. And as I say, moving forwards, this advocacy is so important for how brands are going to be perceived because it's no longer about one marketing person deciding how the company is going to be shown to the world. So the future of work actually looks very different from that perspective because everyone is a brand advocate, not just the marketing department. Another nice thing about this was that you can look at gamification. You look at adding narratives and points and badges and things like that. But you have to have a reason to do it. Technology for the sake of technology just isn't worth doing because it costs money. It takes time. It takes training. And when we were delivering this, it was for a very specific purpose. It was to solve a problem they had, a consistency across a global company. So we were using technology to solve that problem in a really sort of unique way. And again, the future of work doesn't have to be science fiction. We aren't all going to be sat there in two years' time with virtual reality helmets on in our homes in a virtual office pretending we are in the office because it's not practical. There's no reason to do it. It doesn't solve an actual problem. So the future of work doesn't look all that different, but we might have sit-stand desks. Definitely invest. Not the treadmill desks, though. They're rubbish. Um, <laughs> although I have seen ones where you sit back in them and the screen's up here and the computer's there. It looks great fun. So, Bill, want one of those next. Um, but the point is, technology, when you deliver technology into a large company, has to have a purpose. And we all like to think of kind of Minority Report, the film where the guys are touching the thin air and uh, using a computer up there, or the Avengers and superhero films where it's all virtual reality and augmented reality. And if you work in an environment where that's important, great, that's going to happen. But it doesn't have to happen for most people. They all be engaged with things that are much more practical than that, as long as you put a bit of thought into it. And this is where the new generations coming in need to have that bit more thought because they have more choices, they have more options. The future of work is much more flexible. People don't have to stay in one company for life. That idea of a job for life doesn't really exist anymore and hasn't done for a very long time. Um, so when you look at how a company is structured, the, the upside down structure is really interesting because the people at the top of that structure, you've got to try a lot harder to keep them because they can be taken away quite quickly because there are other people out there who are offer them very similar things. So you have to stand out. And doing little things like this, just give people that first day, they go in and go, oh, that's really interesting, that's a bit different. It's adding something non-traditional to your traditional way of working. So it's important to understand where this all fits together for any company. And anyone can do these things. You don't have to be a massive tech company to start doing stuff like this. Consistency. Provide people with one view of everything. You can't have a company now where everybody has different views of how the company works. I've worked at companies where if you ask 20 different people what the company does, they'll give you a different version of the answer. Large consultancies are terrible for this because they do so much, no one really understands what they do. And as an employee coming into it, and you're used to you come straight out of university, you're used to quite a structured way of working. You come out of work and you want to work the way you want to work and then somebody says to you, what do you do? And you go, oh, a bit of this, a bit of that, a little bit of HR occasionally, do a little bit of marketing. Uh, what does the company do? Oh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so you do some HR. It doesn't really help you. No one really understands that. You want to say, 
I'm the marketing manager for whatever, and I get involved with this, 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 and this. Our company does this. That, you need that. That has to be there, because whenever they go onto social media and start talking to their friends about this, and they start saying, you know, oh, that, your company sounds really interesting, they go, meh, that's not the response you want. You want them to go, the company's amazing, they do all this great stuff, we, every day is a really exciting day. You want that. And that starts by being consistent about how you talk to them, your values. And if you have a corporate value structure, live it, breathe it. It's part of what you do, and it's part of what your company is, so actually believe in it yourselves and lead from the top down, or from the bottom up in your case. Because if you, if you don't live those brand, you don't live those values, then how can you be consistent across the brand? Advocacy. Not only is it important to let your employees have a voice and to trust them to speak about you, listen to them internally. Create systems that allow them to be heard within the company because they have the best ideas about how your company's going to run, not you. If you run a company, you've had your idea, you've started that company, you've got your vision of it, the way you evolve is by listening to other people, by learning from them. So give them a voice, let them feel like they have some impact on the company. One of the things we talk about in gamification an awful lot is autonomy. And autonomy requires people to have that freedom to feel they can speak, that they can do, they can have ideas, they can get involved and they can improve stuff. If you don't give them that, they aren't going to engage with the company. Even if you can't spend fortunes on big um, platform solutions, you can certainly put an ideas box in the corner of a room and actually read what the ideas are and implement them and congratulate people and recognise them for those ideas. And technology. Now, just going to take a second to talk about the pool table paradox. The pool table paradox. There is a joke within our office that to engage people, pool tables appear suddenly. So a, corporate, a company survey will come through, morale is low, what do we do? We'll put a pool table in the coffee room, that'll be brilliant. Now, I've worked in a few companies where similar things have happened. In our case, it was a Wii. Um, and what was great about the Wii was it got locked in a cupboard and no one knew where the key was. So, but the box was ticked. We were engaged because they had done something that was different. It was non-traditional. They bought a Wii. Problem was, no one ever played it. As far as I'm aware, it's still in that cupboard seven years later. And I don't think anyone knows where that cupboard is. It's like that, uh, the, room of, um, the room of needs in uh, Harry Potter. It'll open one day when someone desperately needs a wee. No, that sounds wrong. Um, so but there's this thing where I will engage people and motivate them by putting a pool table or a ping pong table or a ball pit in the middle of a room, and everyone's going to be great. That's going to be great fun. And for about two days, people will go, oh, that's really interesting, and they'll go back to work. Because what does it really do? All you've done is said, I've spent a few hundred quid on a pool table because you all seem like you're a bit down. I love the idea of the last Rolo. I hope you buy a lot of packs of Rolos, though. <laughs> because in certain companies, that, you need a lot of Rolos for the, for the disengaged people. And a pool table's not going to do it. So the pool table paradox is it seems like a really good idea, but actually can have exactly the wrong um, impact. Because you extrapolate that out to a large company where the pool table is a massive technological solution that you have spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on, but you haven't thought it through. If we think about the pool table for a second, on the employee survey, how many employees said, I want a pool table? Where was the research that went into buying the pool table? The same thing, we're all disengaged, we need a technological platform that's going to solve those problems. Here it is, cut and paste, slap, there it is, 100 grand please. Now, when you do that, what actually happens is, all these employees who are free thinking, free speaking, are very modern and technology savvy, are going to look at it and go, well, oh, that costs a lot of money. Why can't I have a pay rise? Because actually, in my employee survey, what I said was, I'm not very happy because I can't afford to pay my rent. So you have to, the technology thing is really important because you have to understand why you're having it and what it's going to solve. If you can't answer either of those questions, you need to go back to the drawing board and start thinking about it. In the meantime, definitely buy a pool table for the few people that did want it. And if the pen's going to work, I think that was the last slide. Hang on. And that was the last slide. And I think the next slide's your favourite one because it says break at the end. Thank you very much, Andy.